good. Good morning. It's so good to be with you all. And uh, I think Hugh mentioned a word a moment ago, a beautiful rabble or something like that to describe this church. It's so good to be together. It really does feel like being with family here. I know many of you personally, um, but it's so good to just see you and see how this church is continuing to grow and thrive. And uh, I want to just, uh, before I unpack today's message, which as Hugh said is about spiritual well-being, I want to um, encourage you, Redeemer Church, to um, to really take a hold of the the, the the kind of burdens of prayer that your, your elders, your pastors have. Um, I know that right now, uh, as a church, we're kind of like pretty full here. There's not much more room to grow. There'll be people who are not here today that would normally be as well. And uh, really, right now, there's kind of like a bit of a dilemma as to what, what do we do? Because this church has got, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure much, much more growth ahead. And uh, this venue is kind of full. And I know that Hugh and the other elders would have talked about this in the past, but I just want to encourage you, um, Redeemer Church, to really, uh, when you next gather to pray and when you hear from uh, your elders, to really take a hold of the things that they are burdened with in prayer and to really make them your own prayers as well. Um, that might be about, okay, Lord, what do we do with building? But it's bigger than that. It's, it's about what uh, these guys are believing God for here in Colchester and, uh, and beyond as well. And I just want to encourage you to, uh, to somehow um, take a hold of what they're praying for, those burdens that they have on their hearts and say, I'm going to make that my burden too. I'm going to pray with these guys. I'm going to really, uh, I'm going to really seek God uh, for uh, this church and to really own this church in prayer. I do believe that's so important to do that, for all of us to play our part in that. I just felt as we were worshipping that God just uh, nudged me to share that. So, so good to be together, guys. And uh, I want to just reiterate uh, Mika and Hugh's encouragement to uh, be at Scent. Um, it's going to be such a great time. So if you're a young adult, uh, if you know any young adults um, that uh, you know would just love to be there, then please do get booked in and be with us. So we're looking at God's plan for your well-being over this series. You've been looking at things like uh, emotional well-being, physical well-being. There's other types of well-being to come in this series, relational well-being, vocational well-being, um, mostly things that rhyme. And, uh, and it's, it's going to be such a helpful series as you uh, unpack these things, as you take time, as you said last week, just take time to, to stop and to kind of look at what's going on within and to apply God's wisdom to your life. Such a helpful uh, series to be going through, to take time to slow down and to intentionally look at what's going on inside and to build in habits uh, that will really help us. And so today we're looking at spiritual well-being and we need to First, before we unpack this any further, we need to acknowledge this, that we are more than just physical beings. Now, that is probably something that I, you know, many of you would accept, but we need to acknowledge we are more than just physical beings. There's a, a very short verse to share with you um, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm just going to turn there now. Where the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Thessaloniki, he says this, Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's uh, making it very clear that the whole person involves more than just the physical. Now Christians have debated for centuries, cleverer Christians than me, are Christians, uh, you know, are are we body, soul and spirit or just body and soul? There's a big debate about that. I'm really not interested in that at all, okay? But what I do want to to point out to us is that there is more than just the physical. And this is so alien to, uh, to our culture because from a very young age in schools, we are taught in science that we are basically kind of we're physical creatures, we're just bags of, of molecules and we're just bones and organs and blood vessels. But actually the Bible teaches us that we are embodied spirits. We're embodied spirits, we're embodied souls. We are not just physical. We're taught that we're a, we're a bag of molecules and memories. Uh, and, and without God in the picture, let's just face it, let's face the truth. And maybe you're here today and maybe you think, I don't know, I don't think I believe in a God. Without God in the picture, that is the truth. We are just bags of DNA. We're just tubes of DNA. You put food in one end and it comes out the other end. And then you may one day find in your life another tube of DNA to get close to and then produce another tube of DNA. That's the, that's the, that's the basic reality without God in the picture. And our brains are just you know, computer centers that just enable us to survive in this random world by uh, helping us to grow food 
and to find other tubes of DNA to, to make it. That's basically the kind of, that's the picture without God in it. No one would admit that, no one would spell it out like that, but that's the reality. Yeah. If this is all one accident, if this is all a random universe, and uh, things have come about by chance, and that is the reality. But the Bible presents to us something very, very different to this. It shows us that we are more than physical beings, that we are embodied souls, embodied spirits. And when these bodies waste away, as they inevitably will, and some of us know that more than others, as when, when these bodies waste away, there will be something that will go on. There will be something that goes on into eternity. And the Bible tells us that when we first place our faith in Jesus, as we were so helpfully taught during the worship time, that the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. He, God himself, comes to live within us. And, and, and something that was dead within us comes alive. We're made spiritually alive. That's what happens when we place our faith in Jesus, when we say, he is Lord, he's Saviour. And the Holy Spirit, he testifies with our spirit again and again throughout our lives that we are children of God. So we're spiritual beings, we're more than physical beings. And just as we need to take care of our physical health, and just as there would be dire consequences if we were just blasé about our physical health, if you know you just kind of dropped a finger off accidentally one day and you thought, no, I'm just going to leave it, or, or you just, or whatever it might be, you're noticing some symptoms, and you think, I'm just going to put it off. There will be dire consequences if you just put it off and just ignored it. Just as there would be for our physical health, there will be dire consequences for our spiritual health if we don't kind of keep tabs on how we're doing. If we don't assess uh, for ourselves, are we growing spiritually? Are we spiritually healthy? We've got to be attentive to these things, and that's what I want to unpack for us today. So today, in the time we have remaining, I want to I want us to consider how we can grow, how we can grow spiritually, how we can maintain a spiritual well-being, and I want to do that by looking at a psalm, Psalm 63. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, the psalms are a, a collection of songs and poems, mostly written by a guy called David, who was a great king in the Old Testament. Some of you uh, are maybe not familiar with the Bible, you may know of the story of David and Goliath, and where this... A uh, young teenager killed a giant that was frightening his whole nation with a slingshot and a stone. And uh, David became king of Israel, a mighty king, led him in many great victories. And we're going to see him at a pretty low end in Psalm 63. So it begins like this, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now, when you see those little uh, side notes in the Bible, that's not put there by Bible translators. That was in the original text, that particular bit there. It's, we need to understand where David is at, at this particular moment in time. He's in the wilderness. What is a king doing in the wilderness, you might ask? Well, David had got himself into a right mess. David, who was doing a seemingly good job as the king, uh, he is now wriggling from the consequences of serious sin in his life. He's in a place where he has committed adultery and he's essentially committed murder. So there was a day, uh, we read in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, this story of uh, it the time of year where the kings would normally go out to uh, fight alongside their troops, they would lead their troops into battle. David stayed back and there's a day where he's a bit bored, he goes for a walk one day and he sees a beautiful woman uh, bathing. She's probably naked or not got much on, and he thinks, I've, I've got to have her. And he, he, his pride kind of wells up within him, and he thinks, I've got to have her. She's, she's going to satisfy me. She's going to make me feel good. And so he commits adultery. He has, he has this woman. Uh, he beds her, as it were, and then he learns that she's married and that she, uh, this guy, Uriah, her husband, is in his army. And so he has it arranged that Uriah needs to be on the front line of the battle. And he says to his commanders, um, when, Uriah's, when we're next in battle, make sure you fall away from the front line and leave Uriah in his own so that he dies. So that Uriah might know, you know, so he can basically marry Bathsheba, this woman. So he's, he's committed adultery and he has committed murder, essentially. He's had this guy killed. And we read in, in uh, 2 Samuel that uh, it's, we see that David had done evil in the sight of God. And God basically uh, says to David, a sword's going to rise up in your family. That basically within your family, someone's going to come and oppose you. And that's what happens with his son Absalom. 
and Absalom sort of rises up and opposes David and kind of fast forward a little bit, it comes to the point where David can't stick around in Jerusalem anymore. He can't be there any longer because his son's too powerful. And so David and his crew get out of there and they head to the wilderness of Judah. That's the situation that, we, that David finds himself in. That is why there's a king in the wilderness because it's as a consequence of very serious sin. He's, he's knowing some of the consequences of, of sin in this life. That we reap what we sow. Praise God, because of what Jesus has done, if we've placed our faith in him, we reap what Jesus has sown. You know, we, we know eternity with him, we know forgiveness, we know adoption into the family of God. However, there are still consequences on earth to our sin. Yeah. We know sometimes. We, we can get into a right mess, and David has absolutely done that. He's been humbled big time. He's got a lot wrong, but what he gets, and what he does next, he gets right. He comes to God. He comes to the realization that at the core of his problems is actually a spiritual problem. At the core is, is something that he has neglected spiritually. He comes to see that he needs God and that he can't sort it by himself. He comes to realize he's not attended to his spiritual well being. His poor spiritual health has led to wrong actions on his part. Now, there, there was a bunch of people uh, a few hundred years ago called the Puritans. They get a lot of bad press for being very strict. If you ever watched Horrible Histories, which is a hilarious program, by the way, uh, they, there's a whole section they do on the Puritans, and they're really strict people, and they're, it's just, they, they poke fun at them big time. Now, what they, they may have been strict in some ways, I, I don't really know, but what they did get right was that they, they knew to, how to seek after God and to enjoy yeah. spending time with God. Now, there was a guy called John Flavel, uh, who wrote this amazing quote, which we'll read a little bit more of later. He says this, The soul is so constituted that it craves fulfillment from things outside itself. And it will embrace earthly joys. Is that me? It will embrace earthly joys for satisfaction when it cannot reach spiritual ones. I'll say that again. The soul is so constituted, its, it's design is made up that it craves fulfillment from things outside itself. And it will embrace earthly joys for satisfaction when it cannot reach spiritual ones. So as an embodied spirit or an embodied soul, you and I are so made that we have desires that only God can satisfy. That only he can really satisfy. Your soul longs for unconditional acceptance. That's what you're longing for. And you may be trying to find it in all kinds of different ways. You might be trying to find it in... Just trying to find the right person that will that you know you can have, you can marry or sleep with or whatever it might be. You you might be looking for it in that. What you'll ultimately find is that doesn't satisfy. It doesn't fulfill deep down. Your soul is looking for something that is unshakable and unmovable and unchangeable and steady and steadfast. And you will not find that in any human being. You'll only find it in God. Yeah. Your soul is looking for glory. It's looking for glorious things. It's searching. For things that will satisfy it. We long for the living God deep down. And there was an African theologian who lived many, many years ago called St. Augustine. And he said this very famous quote, you may have heard it before. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. We've been made for God. You and I were made to know God. We were made to walk with him. And our soul craves fulfillment through things outside of itself because it was made to find fulfillment in God alone. It can only be satisfied in God. But it will go after other things if we're not regularly coming back again and again to see God for who he is. If we're not coming again and again to rejoice in who he is. And David had not kept his eyes fixed on God. David had... had, had had kind of taken his eyes off God, and what happened? His soul had craved fulfillment from something other than God. He had seen a beautiful woman, and his pride said, I've got to have that. That, if I have her, I'm going to be fulfilled. If I have her, then I'm really, really going to be, I'm going to know satisfaction. And it didn't lead to that. So you see, you see how spiritual well being is so important. You see how this is, this is more than about kind of feeling like you're doing well. I've got to February in my Bible reading plan, and I'm still going. <laughs> 
Well, I had, I had five minutes prayer time in the shower this morning, or I invited a friend to church or to Alpha. It's, it's more than about doing well in some practical things. This is about having our souls deeply nourished and satisfied. Because this is what we need, this is what we long for. And if we don't attend to this, then actually our, our souls will yearn for other things and go after other things, and actually we'll end up in dire consequences. We may not end up in a wilderness, literally, but we'll end up in a wilderness in many other ways. We're talking about the deepest things imaginable here. John Flavel, in that same quote that I started to read, he said, ecstasy and delight are essential to the believer's soul. And they promote sanctification, this process by which we made more and more like Jesus. We were not meant to live without spiritual exhilaration. And the Christian who goes for a long time without the experience of heartwarming, this is an old-fashioned language, but I think we understand what he means, will soon find himself tempted to have his emotions satisfied from earthly things and not as he ought from the Spirit of God. The believer is in spiritual danger if he allows himself to go for any length of time without tasting the love of Christ and savouring the felt comforts of a Saviour's presence. One last bit. When Christ ceases to fill the heart with satisfaction, our souls will go in silent search of other lovers. And by enjoyment of the love of Christ in the heart of a believer, we mean an experience of the, of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given to us. We need to know this, friends. We need to know this regularly. Not, hey, I had a great time with God when I was 16. And I, you know, or, and I had that camp many years ago, or whatever it might be. Or at, the, at the, 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 the Women's Day yesterday. No, we need this regularly to keep coming back again and again to know this uh, quite strange phrase, this heartwarming, this spiritual exhilaration. We need to come to see Jesus for who he is and rejoice in him. So we've kind of seen how David ended up in that spiritual danger. It had huge consequences for himself, for his family, for his nation. It kind of was much wider than just one man and one woman. And I had a story just a couple of years ago about a pastor who had um, committed adultery. And he had a fling with another woman. And another pastor asked him, what were you thinking? What was going on? And he, and he said... I thought that by dabbling in sin, I could take a bullet. I could, I could take a bullet. You know, if I got taken out of ministry, so be it. And what he said actually was what I realised was that I'd let a hand grenade go off in my family, and many hand grenades go off in my church. There's, there's, there's wider consequences when these things happen, when we fall into the trap that the enemy has laid for us. So David now does the right thing. He seeks God, he's come to the end of himself. And this is what we're going to read. We're going to read this amazing psalm, Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. I want to pick out three keys to spiritual well-being from this passage. We're going to go through them quite quickly. The first is this, that we need to acknowledge that this world is a dry and weary land. We need to understand that. We need to picture what David's view would have been as he wrote this psalm. He's in a wilderness. Nothing is thriving. There's no great 
vegetation. He's in a wilderness in a land that is scorched regularly and it's barren. And he's looking around and he's saying, like a, like a dry, weary land. This is what he's picturing. And friends, we need to acknowledge that this is the world in which we live. It's a dry and weary land. Now, you might think, hang on, there's so much good in this world. Yes, there is. There is good things for us to enjoy in this world that God has given. But when we make those things the ultimate thing, when we, when we seek to see the giver behind the gifts, actually those things don't satisfy. And, and we, we are uh, kind of left feeling empty and we're left feeling uh, dry and barren and weary. And we may, maybe you're here today and you might think, yeah, I'm coming to church because I need to, I've, I've experienced this for myself. I've put on a good front. And many people put on a good show, don't they? Put on a good front of, I've got my life all together. I've got my family. I've got my spouse. I've got my dream job or my dream car or my great holiday or whatever it might be. But actually deep down, it's really not all together. That is the reality, friends, for the world. That it might, it might look on the surface like things all together, but actually deep down it's a dry and weary land where there's not a thriving going on. And we need to acknowledge that. Because if we, if we kind of deep down think, I'd be better off if I kind of went back to my old life, then we're going to end up kind of in the place that David was at. But if we acknowledge, no, no, there was nothing in this world that really satisfied. There was nothing that ultimately led to me uh, knowing that soul satisfaction. We, we need to resolve this. We, do, we need to, to, to really to, to acknowledge, no, there's no going back. I don't want to go back there because actually... I was running after things that I thought would satisfy and they didn't come close. Are you, have you resolved that? There's a story in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, where the, uh, the Israelite people are being led out of slavery uh, by Moses. God's done amazing miracles and they kind of wandering around before God brings them into the, the land that he promised them. And they start to come to complain and mumble, I wish we were back in Egypt when we were slaves. At least we had kind of guaranteed dinner on the table every day and so on. They start to sort of look back and say, I wish I was back there. Have you, have you had those thoughts, friends? And I wish I was, it was, it'd be much easier if I wasn't living for Jesus. It'd be much easier if I kind of went back there, just pursued the things that everyone else is pursuing. Or have you resolved and acknowledged, no, no, that is a dry and weary land where there is no water, where there is no thriving. Have you come to see that there's only thriving and true living water in Jesus. Have you come to find that? Have you come to acknowledge that? Or are you still kind of looking over your shoulder and thinking, that does look pretty good. Listen, friends, that is a mirage. You know what a mirage is when you're in a desert, in a wilderness, and you think, I see a beautiful pool of water. It's not there. It's not what it seems to be. It'll only lead to slavery. It'll only lead to misery. We go after the things that the world are running after. Trying to find approval from others. Trying to... Uh, have people love us and, and, and praise us and worship us. No, no, we need to come to see that God only satisfies. So we need to first acknowledge that. that actually, in the world, there is, there is actually it's a dry and weary land. We sing this song sometimes, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. I've put, I put my, I turned my back on these things. There were some things that I once ran after. I've turned my back on these things. Have you, have you acknowledged that? Have you decided I, there's no turning back? It's not going to be an easy life, but it's a glorious life. The pursuit of God. Is, I, I, there may be some things that from time to time look attractive, but I'm not going back there. Because I'm, I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus. Second key is this. Don't just do church. Seek God. David says, earnestly I seek you. This, this seeking here is to search and to desire with the intent to attain or achieve something. There's, there's a real kind of going hard at this. I'm seeking God in a, in a big way. I'm, I'm going after him. We're talking about consciously going hard at focusing our heart's attention and affection on God to enjoy him, even as we have this morning, even as we've tasted afresh of his goodness, just to go after him and to know that, that spiritual ecstasy, that heartwarming as we do so. The pursuit of Christianity is God himself. It's the pursuit of God himself. It's not the pursuit of life change, primarily. It's not the pursuit of anything else but God himself, primarily. 
Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the, that's the goal. That's, that's what we're pursuing, is to know him, to love him more, to seek him earnestly, in David's words. You were made for God, as St. Augustine said. You were made for him, to know him, to enjoy him, to revere him, to talk with him, to walk with him, to trust him, to love him. This is what you were made for, to walk with him, as we read in Genesis, as, uh, as the first humans walk with God in the cool of the day. They knew him, enjoyed his friendship. In his fatherly ways. He's the great prize. It's not the stuff that he gives you. He's the great prize. God is the prize. And the best thing about heaven won't be the absence of sin and sorrow and shame and sickness. It will be the presence of God. That will be the best thing about heaven. To be with him. To see him face to face. To know him. To finally oh, see him face to face. And sometimes... We, we, we read those verses where Jesus says, love the, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we think, in God uh, commanding us to do that, we think, is he being a bit egotistical? <laughs> love me! Love me! No, he's being the most loving he can possibly be to point people to himself. Because if he was to point us to anything else, it would be second best. And he's saying, love me, see me, love me, pursue me, see me earnestly. This is the very best thing for you. Everything else will enslave you, leave you feeling disappointed when you put it in the ultimate place. But when you put me in the ultimate place, you'll know satisfaction. So sometimes the pursuit of God has been reduced to doing church. And you guys are an active church, and I commend you. This is such a beautiful church to be a, uh, to be a part of. But sometimes we think, I'm doing church, and therefore I'm pursuing God. I'm, I'm turning up on Sundays, I'm going to life group. I'm going to serve on such and such a ministry. We can sometimes lose sight of, actually, the, the, the goal in life is just to earnestly seek him, is to pursue him. And so, yes, seek God for a glorious church and give your all to, to but, the, but the goal of our gatherings is to seek God. The goal of our friendships is to help each other to seek God. That's just, this is the goal of it all. The, the various ministries and roads you can be involved with is all part of a bigger goal, which is we want to love God, pursue Him, seek Him. Sometimes we can end up kind of doing church and we lose sight of the bigger picture. Maybe you're in that place, some of you. I've kind of got into a bit of a rut. I'm not pursuing God. Sometimes the pursuit of God has been reduced to self-improvement. And certainly as we put in place some of the very wise things that we're going to learn in this series and already that you've started to put in place. Surely, as we put in place God's wisdom, yes, we're going to see some wonderful things improving in our lives. But that's not the goal. The goal isn't some, I'm going to you know, improve myself. That's to seek God. God doesn't want you to just seek the things that come from his hand. He wants you to seek his face. To not just kind of go after the things that you can get, but to, to come to know the, 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 the giver of these good gifts. Surely he wants to answer our prayers, yes. Surely he wants to, us to petition him, to ask things of him. But he wants you more than anything to delight in him, to find your soul to be satisfied in him, because it won't be satisfied with other things. It won't be. So let me urge us to seek him earnestly, to make him the priority of our lives. This is what we read uh, in verse 6 in that psalm. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Remembering him, even in the watches of the night. Some of you might have young children, you know the watches of the night a bit too well at the moment. Some of you might be in a different stage of life where for whatever reason you're not sleeping so well. You remember him. It's not, oh, there's a God. No, it's remembering him and remembering what he's done for you and thinking of his goodness. But it's prioritizing him. It's putting him first. Is he first? There are so many distractions. There's so many distractions in our lives. Our phones. We touch our phones over 2,000 times a day on average. I read that in multiple sources yesterday. I don't think that's inaccurate. I think that's probably true. That's crazy. One researcher said we spend a sixth of our year on our phone. This is crazy. 
There's so many distractions vying for our attention. I was in a meeting on, on Friday, just had a couple of hours with some people. It was a lovely time, encouragement and, and prayer together. What did I do straight after the meeting? Instead of thanking God for that meeting, instead of thinking about it a little bit more, I went straight to my phone. What have I missed in the last two hours? What has happened in the world? And I missed absolutely nothing, is the answer. Absolutely nothing of any importance. And yet we're so eager, aren't we? To go, what have I missed in the seven hours that I've been asleep? Has anyone important died? Or has there, you know, have I got any notifications on my social media? Has anyone WhatsApp me? Does anyone need me? We're so quick to that, aren't we? Oh, what about God? I'm putting him first. Prioritizing him. Dare I say it that we're surrounded not just by kind of noise from things like social media, but we're even surrounded by Christian noise. Uh, many, many of us will spend a lot of time with earphones in listening to Spotify and you know, listening to great Christian worship music, okay? I know that many of us will do that. Wonderful. But I think sometimes we're in danger of listening to other people singing about their encounters with God, yeah. but actually not really encountering God for ourselves. And we're kind of thinking, well, I'm, I'm having time with God because I'm listening to this band and they're singing great songs. But you're not really engaging your heart and mind with Him. You're not really filling your heart with the truth and coming to be satisfied in Him. We can, we can be so in danger of drowning out God with Christian noise. It might be listening to sermons. It might be reading books. And all of those things are good. And I commend you to do those things. But we can sometimes fill our minds and our ears with Christian noise. And not actually seek after God for ourselves. Let's seek after him. Don't do church, seek him. Don't do self-improvement, seek him. Push aside distraction and seek him. Be with him. Final thing I want to just pull out from this is cling to him at all times. There will come times in your life where this running after God, this seeking after him doesn't look very impressive. Where it looks pretty rubbish to be honest. You're not prevailing in mighty prayer for hours on end. You're not, you know, calling upon God to do wondrous, wondrous things. You're not feeling particularly great. There are times in life where this just looks like you clinging to him. My soul clings to you, David says. And when I read those verses, I, I picture myself as a child uh, when I would go on a long journey with my family. We'd go and visit family in Wales and we'd fall asleep in the car, my brother and I. And at the end of the night, when we kind of got to our destination, it's late and it's dark, and your parents just pick you up out of the car and bundle you into the house and get you to bed. And you kind of just like, a, you're just a bit awake, you're not really sure what's going on, but you're just putting your arms around your parents, you're clinging to them. And I'm just going to allow you to carry me. I'm just going to get, you're just gonna, you, you know the way. My children do the same now. It's just, when I read that verse, I think of, I don't really know what I'm doing, where I'm going. This is hard right now, but I'm clinging to you. And there's been times where my prayer life in recent days has looked like that. Lord, I don't know what's going on here. This is difficult. This thing I'm dealing with is difficult, but I'm just going to cling to you. I'm just going to hold on. And sometimes it doesn't, so it doesn't, doesn't look particularly impressive, but it's a clinging to God. I think David is an example for us in many things. He's not in some other things, as we've already heard this morning. But he's an example for us in his honesty before God. We, we see again and again in the Psalms, him pouring his heart out to God. He, 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 uh, he says, I'm languishing in Psalm 6. He says, my soul is greatly troubled. He says, I'm weary from groaning. This is all one psalm. I flood my bed with tears, he says. In other Psalms, he says, there's sorrow in my heart all day. He says, see my affliction. I have no rest. I'm lonely and afflicted. I'm in distress. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. I cry to you for help. I plead for mercy. This is his soul clinging to God. So sometimes, friends, it, it will look wonderful. I'm, in, I'm flowing in prayer. I'm calling upon him for great things. I'm, I'm, I'm in some victory here. But sometimes it will look like my soul clings to you. I just need you, Lord. Would you help me? I'm going to get through this. This is a man who walked with God <laughs> through life's highs and lows. He's a man after God's own heart. Yes, he made some awful mistakes, but he clinged to God. And I want to tell you, just as we close, I've walked with God for 18 years. At age of 16, 
I, I came to understand what God had done for me in Jesus. I came to understand, I came to, uh, to see Jesus as my Saviour, my Lord, turned away from the way I was living and put my faith in Him. And I tell you, for that last 18 years, I've, I've, there's been times when it's looked like my soul clings to you, and there's been times where for many months I thought, oh, this is, I just can't wait to go and be with God, and I can't wait to go and pray. And it started for me, walking with God, literally walking with God, as I, as I pushed trolleys around a car park. As my job, I basically, as a supermarket, I worked at a supermarket at 16 to 18, and from uh, about 9 till half 10, every time I worked, I had to push trolleys around a car park. And I learned to just sing out to God and pray. Then I'd walk home and I'd just pray and just learn friendship with God. And I, I, I've not stopped doing that. I love just walking with God. And tomorrow morning, I, I'm going to go and walk with God. I'm, I'm at this stage where, I don't know if you find this, try and clear all your WhatsApps or your emails or whatever. There's so many inboxes to clear these days. And then I'm going to get the time with God. Listen, I've got to just get time with God. I, I, just, I just need to prioritise Him. There may be many, many other things that might be uh, vying for my attention right now, but I've got, to, I've got to be with Him. I've got to come and be with Him. Jesus had people vying for his attention a lot. Can you imagine the great healings he did? Many times where his disciples go looking for him, they can't find him because he's gone off to lonely places to pray. He had to just attend to his, his relationship with his father. Can I encourage you, can I urge you, attend to your relationship with God. Go and be with him. Anything else can wait. If Jesus could allow people who were suffering and needed healing to wait, other things can wait, right? We, God needs to be our priority. We'll walk with him. Be honest with him. Pouring out your heart in honesty. Tell him how you feel. He, he already knows how you feel. He already knows. But he loves it that we bring it to him. And as we bring it to him, there comes a freedom. There comes a fresh perspective. So often, yes, he wants to answer our prayers and the practical petitions we bring him, but so often he just wants to bring us a fresh perspective as we pray. He wants us to see it in a different light. To be, have our burdens taken off our shoulders. Let me urge you and encourage you, friends, to cultivate a walk with God. It might be physically walking. I love to, to physically walk because it means that everything else is set aside. <coughs> Phone goes in the car, glove compartment. I'm just going to be away from everything. Sometimes it might just be in your room. Jesus said to me, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door. The problem is, with us in the 21st century, is that in our room we might have a phone, an iPad, an Apple Watch, <laughs> or whatever it might be. I'd love to get an Apple Watch because I'd like to count my steps. That would be the only thing I want to do. But I dare not get one because that would be another thing that would distract me. I just, we need to get time alone with our Father. So let me urge you to cultivate your walk with Him. This is the, the thing that will lead to spiritual well-being. And everything else will be in its rightful place as you do that. Seek Him first. Can I pray for us and maybe the band, maybe time for a song, I don't know how we're doing for time, but let's pray together, shall we? I'd love to pray for this wonderful church, that we'd more and more step into these things. Father God, we just, uh, let's, let's stand together, let's stand together. Father God, we, right now, we just want to uh, come to you and say, Lord, we want to earnestly seek your face. We've seen, Lord, we've acknowledged that everything else is a dry and weary land. Lord, even when we thought we'd go after a great career or we'd go after great experiences of travel or, or whatever it might be, hitting the nightclubs, Lord, we've seen that these things are empty. Lord, and we've seen that only you satisfy. And so, Lord, we just want to say now, Lord, help us to seek you. We don't want to just do church, Lord. We don't want to just go after some self-improvement. We want to seek you. We want to earnestly seek your face. We want to walk with you. We want to pour out our hearts to you. We want to be those that sing to you and sing of your goodness. Just as we have even this morning, we want this to be our daily reality, Lord. We want to be those that are spiritually alive because you've made us alive. You, we were once dead in our trespasses and our sins, but... You, being rich in mercy, you made us alive. 
And we thank you that we are now alive to you. We're now alive to you. And we want to walk in the goodness of that, Lord. We want to walk in the goodness of what you've done for us. I pray for my brothers and sisters here that we would cultivate a, a beautiful walk with you. That we would know everything else can wait. That you come first, Lord. That you are our biggest priority. Lord, our soul, it, it longs for you. My soul longs for you. Lord, in this dry and weary land, in this dry and weary world, we know that you are the source of living water. You're the source of living water, Lord. Help us to help us to tap into that source day by day. To be satisfied with you. To know this heartwarming, to know this spiritual exhilaration, this ecstasy, Lord, in walking with you. I pray that for every one of my brothers and sisters here. Maybe you just want to just, maybe you were in your own words, you just want to say to God, I want to know you more. I want to, I want to be walking with you daily. Or just tell him what you want. Lord, we want to be those that have our souls cling to you. Just put it in your own words to him now. Lord, even in the hard times where it's, it's really, really uh, hard to know what's going on, we want to be those that cling to you. Lord, I want that for my life. Thank you, Lord. Lord, for all of those things that are crying for our attention, Lord, we want to say, Lord, we will rise up and we'll seek you. We'll rise up and we'll seek you first. Thank you, Lord. Just for anyone here who, maybe you've come today, you don't know God, maybe you're not a Christian, I want to read these verses from Isaiah chapter 55. This is our invitation. If you, if you don't know this God, if you don't know forgiveness, if you don't know his love being poured out in your hearts, this is what it says. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Has it been that you've been spending your money for that which is not bread, working for that which does not satisfy? You can come today to the one who really will satisfy. You can acknowledge today, I've been going in the wrong direction. I'm going to turn around from that. And I'm going to feast on God and what he has for me. This is what it says later on in that same passage. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You can turn to the Lord today. He'll have compassion on you. He won't be there folded arms saying it's about time. No, he'll have compassion upon you. He'll run to you. He'll turn you around. He'll bring you newness of life. Seek him today. Come to him today. Run to him today. Even as we sing in just a moment. Come to him in your heart. And if you've done that, why don't you speak to one of the people that you've seen leading today, Mika or Hugh or Al or anyone, come and tell them. They would love to help you in your next steps. One of your next steps will be getting baptized. That's what we do. We believe in him and get baptized. Identify with him. Saying goodbye to our old life. Coming to newness of life. And you need to be baptized. As we sing now, why don't you engage with God? He is here. He's in our midst.